our last lecture. Um, in this lecture specifically, I'll be focusing on um, the early sections of chapter 18 um, to discuss fertilization and early development of the human embryo. Specifically in this lecture, we are going to talk about what fertilization is and we'll talk about the early developmental process, so how a single-celled zygote develops to form an embryo, which then creates a fetus, um, and then we'll briefly talk about growth during the second and third trimesters, um, and we'll also talk about effects on the maternal systems, and we'll end this lecture by talking about the process of labor. Um, so kind of the everything from conception to birth is what we will be covering here. So when we talk about early development, um, there are a couple of terms to keep in mind as we discuss this process. Um, the first is development, which really just refers to this gradual change in anatomical and physiological structures and characteristics. Um, throughout conception, um, you know, we start with as a single-celled organism and we go through mitosis to create this multicellular morula, and then that morula goes through this really complex kind of folding process and then later a developmental process to eventually create a newborn. Um, but development doesn't stop at birth. Um, you, if you have younger siblings or younger family members or even for yourself, you've seen that you continue to grow after you were born um, and really development proceeds until maturity. When we talk about development, we're also talking about the fact that during this process, cells are undergoing differentiation. And what that means is that we are essentially starting out with kind of very boring, nondescript cells. Those go on to create stem cells as shown in the bottom figure here. And those stem cells can give rise to highly specialized cells from everything to muscle to intestinal cells. And this specialization or this differentiation of cells arises from turning on or off genes. So um, by regulating which genes are being expressed in a cell, we can create a muscle cell, which is very different from a nerve cell, which is very different from a liver cell. So not only are our bodies undergoing development during the processes that we're talking about today, but cells are also going under different, undergoing differentiation during this development as well. So let's actually talk about how this all starts. So in your lectures about the male and female reproductive systems, this process of fertilization was discussed briefly in those crash course videos that I provided to you all. But I wanted to talk about this process a little more in depth because it really, we wouldn't be here if fertilization did not occur. Um, so the picture here on the right is actually showing what fertilization might look like, where we have this really large egg here from the female. And we can see that there are, I mean, probably in this case, thousands of sperm that have attached themselves to this egg. Fertilization itself is when the gametes, sperm and egg, physically fuse to create a zygote. So the single-celled organism that is created from the fusion of these two gametes is called a zygote. Um, this typically, in order to have a pregnancy that can implant into the uterus and, and start through the whole um, you know, nine-month process of development, um, this usually needs to occur in the upper first third of the fallopian tube, um, and that is because we'll talk about how the egg needs to undergo some changes in order to be kind of at the right time and the right place to embed itself in the uterine lining. And there are two key players, and that is the egg and the sperm, or scientifically, spermatozoa and oocytes. So spermatozoa, the sperm that come from the male, um, as discussed kind of previously in your, in your male reproductive um, section, uh, the main role of these cells is to deliver, is to deliver genetic information to the oocyte. Um, it needs to travel a far distance, so it has a huge amount of mitochondria for that energy requirement 
but it's relatively small, which we can say, we can see that here in this figure here on the right. The oocyte itself, the egg, is much larger, and that is because its job is to provide nourishment, and it also um, regulates the genetic programming for the first week of development. So the egg is really responsible for kind of kicking off development. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of kind of what is happening during fertilization, um, it can take the sperm anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to pass from the vagina to the upper portion of the uterine tube. Um, sperm can actually live for about two to three days, which is kind of crazy to think about um, once they have entered kind of the, the female reproductive system. Um, typically, there are 200 million sperm um, per ejaculation. So a huge number of these cells are being released. Of those 2 million, tr only about 10,000 are going to reach the uterine tube. And then fewer than 100 actually reach the oocyte. So these sperm do die as they kind of make this really intense odyssey up the um, vagina through the uterus into the fallopian tube. Um, and therefore, that is a why ejaculate contains so many sperm to start, because there it really is kind of a, an intense process to get all the way to the oocyte. Um, and then just kind of a, like a fact to know is um, when we talk about like infertility in males versus females, in males specifically, if males have a sperm count that is below 20 million per milliliter of um, ejaculate, they are considered sterile. And that's really has to do just with the fact that this number of sperm is not large enough um, to reach the oocyte um, and to cause fertilization. But again, of those 100 that reach the oocyte, only one is going to actually kind of dig its way through the, the shell of the egg and actually fertilize that oocyte. So let's talk about that process. So this figure is from your textbook specifically, and I think it does a really nice job at kind of going through the seven steps of fertilization. Um, I wanted to kind of start a little bit earlier though, and so I'm gonna use some different figures to talk about this process because it's really important that when we talk about fertilization, we actually start at ovulation. So remember, ovulation is when the oocyte is going to be released from the ovaries. And there are some things to keep in mind about this oocyte. So first off, um, we this oocyte is paused in a stage called the secondary oocyte. And it's specifically paused in metaphase 2 of meiosis 2. So we have a haploid cell, however, there are replicated, there are copied portions of chromosome, and they've lined up in the, along the middle of kind of that metaphase plate, but they have not yet undergone anaphase. Meiosis in oocytes is also funky in that, unlike sperm, which create four, meiosis of sperm, in the generation of sperm creates four haploid Sperma, um, spermatozoa. During the meiosis process to create eggs, we only create one egg and, in, and during that process we create these extra kind of cells called polar bodies. So again, we have to deal with the fact that we are trying to separate chromosomes and we're trying to divide chromosome number by half and, but we also want this egg to be kind of chock full of nutrients and have as much kind of stuff inside as it can to support that growing embryo. And so um, to get rid of the extra chromosomes that we don't need, because again, we need a haploid egg, a haploid oocyte, we're going to get rid of those extra chromosomes in what's called polar bodies. There is already one polar body. This came from meiosis 1. And it's just kind of hanging out right now with the secondary oocyte, which is this larger kind of purple structure that I've just circled. 
surrounding the oocyte is a collection of cells called the corona radiata. So corona for crown. And these are cells, um, specifically follicle cells, that are surrounding and basically protecting the oocyte. And then in between kind of the, the purple oocyte in this picture and that pinkish corona radiata is this area called the zona pellucida. And that's just a space and we're going to see it plays a big role in fertilization. So this is kind of where we're at with our egg. It's been released from the ovary. It has not finished meiosis yet. Kind of interesting to think about. At this point, if the egg has kind of started to travel down the fallopian tube and it's reached that upper third, this is when potentially fertilization can occur. Again, this process requires only a single sperm, and we're going to follow that fertilizing spermatozone or a fertilizing spermatozoa, um, and it's, it's this guy here that we have seen has actually gotten into that purple egg. So remember from that previous picture that I've showed you, there could be hundreds of sperm. In this case, we can see some other sperm also attached to the surface of this oocyte. But the whole point of that corona radiata is that it's really thick and it's hard to penetrate. And so in the acrosome, um, in the specifically the kind of head region of the sperm, these, this acrosome actually releases digestion, digestive enzymes. And those enzymes work to basically chew through the corona radiata. So multiple sperm are working to digest this special covering, but only one sperm is going to win. And when that sperm gets all the way through the corona radiata, it actually binds to receptors in that zona pellucida. So it binds in that space and here it's blue, between the, the oocyte and that corona radiata. When that happens, that causes this process called oocyte activation. Essentially what happens is the egg literally electrocutes all of the other sperm off, so they all fall away, and only the sperm that has already entered the oocyte is protected from um, basically that that um, activation. And this is important because it prevents polyspermy. So um, when this activation occurs, it's the oocyte is releasing enzymes, basically electrocutes those um, other sperm off. And this creates, this prevents multiple sperm from fertilizing the one egg. Because again, we only want one sperm, one egg. At the same time, that's also going to tell the primary oocyte to complete meiosis too. And so we're going to see the appearance of a second polar body. And at this point now, we have a haploid egg and we have our haploid sperm. At this point, the genetic information that's being carried by both has not yet combined so we don't consider this yet a diploid organism. That occurs in this second step called pronucleus formation. So at this point now, the sperm has entered the oocyte. We're kind of, we've gotten rid of kind of the corona radiata. We've gotten rid of the other sperm. And we have these, what are called pronuclei or basically immature nuclei from the sperm and the female egg. And eventually what's going to happen is the uh, female nuclear information, so the DNA that's being carried in the egg, starts to form this pronucleus and that causes the spermatozoan to kind of also fall apart and also swell into a pronucleus. Once this has happened, we can go into step three here on the bottom, which basically we, these cells are going to work to now, or sorry, these sets of DNA are now going to work together to combine. And so eventually now we're going, we have now at this point created a diploid organism. And so now at this point, we can say that the, the DNA from mom and dad has combined. And now at this point as well, we're going to go from a single cell 
to this cell is going to start to undergo mitosis. And that's what we see in steps four and five here, where we're going to start to see that the nuclei fuse at this point during what's called amphimixis or amphimixis. We call the resulting single cell a zygote. We can again now say that this is diploid. And that diploid zygote is now going to start to undergo mitosis. And so we start to see mitosis and we have these two new cells and very early cells are called blastomeres. So we're going to see that they undergo anaphase and telophase and cytokinesis and we have two cells that we now call blastomeres. And this is completed about a little over 24 hours after fertilization. So it, it takes a little bit to get going. Um, and at this point though, that those blastomeres are gonna start to go undergo rapid cell division to create a multicellular, basically ball of cells. And so at this point, we can now say that we are going to start to undergo embryonic development. And gestation or pregnancy in women um, is categorized into three segments of time called trimesters. Um, and each is marked by very specific months and, and growth. Um, the first trimester, which consists of months zero to three, um, so really it's kind of saying that this is nine weeks is um, a little kind of a misnomer. It's actually closer, sorry, nine months. It's actually closer to 40 weeks, which is 10 months um, to go from fertilization all the way to birth. But we say that the first trimester is months zero to three, and this includes both embryonic and early fetal development. We'll talk about that in more detail here. And this is when really all of the major organ systems begin to form. So by the end of the first trimester, with the exception of the lungs, really, everything has formed in, the, in terms of the organ systems. And really the second and third trimesters just see them further developing and growing. And the second trimester, which is months four through six, um, this is when we see further development of those organs and organ systems. We see that the body shape and proportions start to change. Um, at the kind of end of the first trimester, embryos look kind of like a little gummy bear. By the end of the second, they start to look like a little human, um, typically by month six. And then the third trimester, months seven through nine, really all that's happening here, um, most of the organ systems are fully functional and your little nugget is just really pounding our, or packing on the pounds, um, really just you're getting rapid fetal growth. We're getting a lot of fat tissue, adipose tissue being deposited um, so that when that baby is born at 40 weeks, they can regulate their body temperature and they're that cute little wrinkly alien looking thing <laughs> that you get to now have for the rest of your life. So um, what I want to do is, in this lecture specifically is really talk about what's happening during the first trimester because this is really considered like the critical period of development and growth. And um, it's, it's also sometimes considered the most dangerous period in a pregnancy because there's a lot that has to happen to ensure that the, the fetus and the embryo are, are growing correctly. So let's look at the first trimester in a little more detail. So for the first trimester includes processes that we call cleavage implantation, placentation, and embryogenesis. So we're going to talk about, you know, everything from fertilization to now we have this kind of rapid cell division. We have mitosis happening. Then it's going to implant into the uterus. We're going to create a placenta. And then at that point, we can start to say that we are undergoing embryogenesis or growth of the embryo. Um, some things to kind of just keep in mind. Um, at the moment of conception, um, the egg is 0. 0.0005 inches in diameter. It is super, super, super small. And it weighs 150 micrograms. A microgram is one one millionth of a gram. So very, very tiny. Um, the way that we clinically date pregnancies is from the beginning of the last menstrual period, 
which is usually actually two weeks before ovulation and fertilization. And so that's why we say that uh, pregnancy full term is closer to 40 weeks or 10 months than it is uh, nine months. Um, by the end, so this is at the beginning of the first trimester. By the end of this, so by the end of month three, the fetus is 2.13 inches long. So kind of like close to from your fingertip to maybe your, your second knuckle of your pointer finger. And it weighs about 14 grams. So it's grown a ton in three months. Um, again, this is considered the most dangerous prenatal stage. Only about 40% um, of conceptions produce embryos that are viable and will, will survive the first trimester. So, and again, um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Our body, it, the female body is really amazing at knowing when things are going correctly and when things aren't. And so there can be um, times when your body needs to unfortunately um, spontaneously abort that embryo that is growing because it knows that it's just it's not developing properly. But let's talk about the very first, um, like the post fertilization, what happens immediately after that process. And that process is cleavage and blastocyst formation. So again, roughly 30 hours post fertilization, that's we're gonna, when we're gonna have cleavage, which is basically the first round of mitosis that's gonna start as soon as those pronuclei form in that zygote. When that first cleavage division happens, we now have what we call, again, blastomeres. Um, blast is just a prefix that we use to describe very early undifferentiated cells. So these cells do not yet know what they are going to be when they grow up. Um, and we're going to produce blastomeres, these early immature cells, every time we divide. And that's going to happen pretty quickly. So roughly 30 hours post-fertilization, so day one, we have two cells. In another 24-hour period, we have four and then by another 24 hour period, we have this structure called the morula. And really all of these stages here, um, after the kind of two cell stage, um, the zygotes are called the pre-embryo. Um, at this point, this morula, which will go on to continue performing mitosis to go from into an advanced morula, um, this is typically at this stage, if fertilization occurred in the right spot of the fallopian tube, this is when the um, morula is going to reach the uterus. Um, days four through six, so shown here, um, we are going to go through more cleavage, so more mitosis. And at the end of that, we're going to create this structure called the blastocyst which basically is just a hollow ball of cells. And um, it's also hatched from that zona pellucida. So it's, it's essentially kind of now a naked little egg. Um, at this point too, the cells, those blastomeres are no longer the same size. Um, they're no longer the same shape. So they're not identical to each other. And we have two kind of layers. We have the trophoblast, which is considered kind of this darker purple outer layer. And then we have the inner cell mass. And this inner cell mass is going to become the embryo. So again, this is still a pre-embryo. We haven't gotten to the embryonic stage yet, but that inner cell mass, those kind of light blue cells are going to become the embryo. At this point, when this blastocyst is fully formed, it hopefully will be in the right place at the right time to now come into contract with the endometrium of the uterus. And at that point, we can go through what is called the implantation process. So we have this blastocyst that has those two parts. We have the inner cell mass, which again is going to become the, um, the embryo. And then we have the trophoblast. And so the placenta, um, which is responsible for providing nutrients and all of that kind of good stuff to a growing fetus, 
the placenta actually is derived from both the original egg and from the female. The trophoblast is kind of the egg's component um, of, the placenta, of the placenta. So this is the, these are the cells that are going to create the placenta, um, at least the embryo's portion of the placenta. But roughly six, seven days post fertilization, the blastocyst is going to implant into the endometrium of the uterus and it's going to start kind of basically this these trophoblast cells are going to start to basically kind of chew their way into the endometrium so that this whole structure is embedded into that layer and this is usually complete by the second week of what we call the pre-embryonic period there's some other kind of crazy stuff that's happening in the blastocyst itself that is worth talking about during this implantation process. And that big thing that's happening is the formation of the amniotic cavity. So at implantation, um, that inner cell mass, again, is going to start separating from the trophoblast layer. So that inner cell mass is going to kind of start to become separate from the cells that will eventually become the placenta. And that separation causes this structure called the amniotic cavity to arise. That structure is filled with amnion. And the amnion or the amniotic fluid, that is the fluid that's going to basically protect the embryo and the fetus throughout pregnancy. Um, so basically this little embryo is going to kind of float around in this fluid filled space and that fluid acts as a cushion um, for this for this little little guy or girl who is growing. Um, it also helps to provide nutrients to the embryo as well. Um, it's actually been shown that embryos, once they get older, can actually swallow and taste the amniotic fluid, and um, that's kind of what helps them like recognize tastes that mom eats during during pregnancy, which is kind of crazy. So they. It's been shown that what you eat during pregnancy, your kiddo might actually have um, more of like a predisposition to the same food because it's already tasted that food in the amniotic fluid, which is kind of crazy. Um, some other structures to keep in mind, which I'm going to circle in green here, are the yolk sac. So the yolk sac um, in humans doesn't actually really provide much nourishment in other organisms like um, chickens, for example, most of the nutrients for that developing um, chick comes from the yolk sac. Um, however, in humans, the yolk sac serves as the initial location for the germ cells. These cells are going to later become sperm or oocytes. They actually are going to migrate from the yolk sac up um, into the embryo, which is kind of a crazy process. Um, we also have this structure called the allantois, um, which I'm trying to find it as I talk. Here we go. And the allantois is going to become the blood vessels that eventually will become the umbilical cord. So the umbilical cord um, we can see in the lower picture here. And then the chorion, again, kind of the, the pink structure that's in this bottom picture, that's going to become the kind of embryonic contribution of the placenta. So I've mentioned this structure a couple of times. I've mentioned that the placenta is derived from both the embryo and mom. So let's actually talk about what the placenta is in a little more detail because it's really important. So the biggest function that the placenta, the placenta provides during pregnancy is that it allows oxygen and nutrients to diffuse from the maternal blood to the embryonic blood. And this is important because it does kind of act as like a barrier um, so that your the mom's blood is not actually mixing with the baby's blood. Um, and that is important because uh, sometimes your baby doesn't have the same blood type as you. So you don't want that blood to mix because you don't want either of you to have basically an allergic reaction to each other. Um, waste from the embryo or the fetus is also removed via the placenta. So it basically kind of acts almost like our capillaries do for our cells. It delivers oxygen and nutrients, removes waste um, from the embryo. 
it also produces its own hormones. It produces human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. It produces estrogen, and it produces progesterone. And this placenta starts developing during the implantation process. Um, so, so it forms about two weeks, um, and this, so shortly after implantation, and is fully developed by about 12 weeks. And the placenta is shown kind of as this like dark purple structure that we see here. Um, and if we zoom into that, we can really see that it allows for kind of a mixing of the maternal and fetal circulation, circulation which is really important. Um, there can be some issues with the placenta. Um, so for instance, depending on where the egg implants into the uterus, um, that placenta can actually be kind of blocking the opening, it can be blocking the cervix. And if that is um, occurring, that is called placenta previa. Sorry, I had to pause for a sec, my dog. Um, but placenta previa, basically, if the placenta is blocking the opening of the cervix, um, that just means that a woman would not be able to have a vaginal birth and they'd have to have a cesarean or C-section. So it's not dangerous, um, at least in modern times. Um, it just means that you have to have your baby in a different way. So we have this kind of now undifferentiated ball of cells that has embedded into the endometrium of the uterus. We have the formation of this, or the beginning of the formation of this placenta. Some other stuff is still continuing to happen. Some crazy stuff is happening still with the um, that, that growing embryo. And that is through a process called gastrulation or germ layer formation. So remember that we've formed this amniotic fluid filled space. And so there are cells that are basically kind of pulling away, that inner cell mass is pulling away. And by day 12, um, there's a third layer of cells that has been created because of the fact that this entire inner cell mass is starting to fold inward on itself. So originally we had kind of this hollow ball of cells and now we're having kind of this, it's like folding inwards on itself. And that's the structure that's being shown here. And gastrulation is the process that we, we call that folding. This gastrulation process forms three um, germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Um, the ectoderm, which is purple, or sorry, blue, will be the outermost layer. The endoderm is yellow and is the deepest layer. And then the mesoderm, it's in the middle, so you can think M for middle, but they also consists of these migrating cells. So notice that these red cells are basically detaching themselves from the ectoderm and then kind of migrating through this space here. And these three layers are eventually going to give rise to all of our organ systems. And which organ systems come from which germ layer are detailed here. Um, I don't want you to memorize this table. I just wanted to provide this to show you that, you know, the ectoderm creates everything from the integumentary, so our skin, all the way to our digestive system. Um, mesodermal, mesodermal contributions also work to create our, our parts of our integumentary system and our skeletal system, parts of our reproductive system and kind of our, our miscellaneous and then endoderm, we can see everything from the endocrine to the reproductive systems come from here as well. So again, don't memorize this. It's just to show you that those three germ layers are going to undergo that differentiation process. And because of that, they are going to give rise to all of the organ systems that you've learned this semester. But let's kind of just keep talking about, so after we've had this gastrulation, let's talk about what just kind of in general continues to happen to those layers of cells. And we call that process embryogenesis. So once those cells have folded inwards, once we've had that gastrulation process, 
we're going to undergo embryogenesis, which is really where we're just working to form the body of the embryo and all of the internal organs. And so again, the first trimester is super critical and, and potentially dangerous because we are trying to create every single organ system that we will have by the time we are born. And really by the second trimester, those organ systems should all exist and they're just going to further develop and grow through the next six months, really, of pregnancy. So this figure here is just showing you kind of in general in from, you know, week two to week 10 of pregnancy, um, what is happening during embryogenesis. Again, I don't want you to memorize these. It's just to show you that during that first trimester, we are undergoing some critical development to create those, those different um, organ systems and organs in our body. And that brings us to the second and the third trimesters. If you need a bit of a break, feel free to pause here, um, but otherwise we will just kind of generally talk about what is happening during these last six months of pregnancy. So, in both the second and the third trimester, these, um, these series of months are really just um, demonstrated by massive fetal growth. In the second trimester, organ and organ system development is going to continue. Um, by the end of the second trimester, the fetus weighs about 1.4 pounds. Remember, it was like grams at the end of the first trimester, so it's gone from grams to pounds. And in the third trimester, um, we're seeing basically that organ systems at this point are ready to perform their normal functions. The only organ system that's not fully developed, it really happens in the, the last month or so of pregnancy, are, is the lungs, just because lungs aren't needed until you get into an airborne environment. Um, but the fetus is going to gain about another 5.7 pounds. Um, it's normal for a woman, depending on her pre-pregnancy weight, to gain anywhere from 20 to 35 pounds over her pregnancy. Um, some of that is coming from baby, some of that's from the placenta, but other um, that's also coming just from the fact that your blood is increasing, your blood volume. So that's actually, we obviously have a lot that's happening with the fetus and, and how it's developing. But let's also talk about what's happening to the maternal systems, because I think that's also just a really fascinating thing. Um, so the respiratory rate and the tidal volume of women increases during pregnancy. Um, this is important. It allows for extra ox uh, production of oxygen and increased removal of carbon dioxide. I'm actually really curious to see how my own respiratory rate changes. Um, I have a Fitbit, and right now, I just got it like a couple months ago, and right now it's keeping track of my, my respiratory rate. And I'm curious to see how that changes once I have my kiddo. Um, amazingly, your blood volume increases by almost 50% by the end of your pregnancy, which is insane. So you have a lot more blood in your body. Um, that's because all of your blood has to go through the placenta. And that's actually reducing the volume in the rest of your body. And just fetal activity in general causes a stimulation of blood production. So you have a lot more blood um, in your body. Um, your requirement for nutrients increases about 10 to 30 percent. It depends kind of just on every woman's different. Um, you technically don't need to be eating a lot extra during your pregnancy, but it, it is important to get in extra calories to help support um, yourself and also your baby. Um, your kidneys are working much harder. Your glomerular filtration rate increases by 50%. Again, you have a lot more blood and um, you need to filter that blood, but it also helps accelerate waste excretion as well. The uterus increases in size, which we're going to talk about here on the next slide. And um, the mammary glands in the breasts are also increasing and should begin secretory activity. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So one of the biggest changes that is happening in a female's body during pregnancy is both the structure and the function of the uterus is changing. Um, and this picture, there's also a lot of animations online that show basically how the growing fetus really just squishes everything else, every other organ system in the abdominal cavity. 
um, and that is largely due to the fact that the baby's growing, but also the uterus is growing. Um, from By the end of gestation, the uterus has grown from 3 inches to 12 inches in length. That's a pretty big change. It weighed 2 ounces pre-pregnancy. It's now 2.4 pounds on average. That's a lot. Um, it can contain up to 2 liters of fluid, fetus, and placenta. That's about 13 to 15 pounds. Um, and the enlargement, it's not actually because you are the, there are more cells in the uterus, but it's actually just because those cells that make up the uterus have gotten bigger. They've expanded. Um, and it also, as the uterus increases, there's also a gradual increase of smooth muscle contractions. It's kind of interesting, but throughout pregnancy, the uterus is actually contracting, um, Ladies in the class, you have already also experienced similar contractions. If you've ever had cramping during your period, those are also contractions of the uterus. Um, but there are these contractions called Braxton Hicks contractions, and those essentially are occurring kind of throughout pregnancy. They just often, you don't feel them until maybe the second trimester, definitely the third. Um, and they're basically practice contractions. Um, they are not labor contractions, so they're not going to cause you to have your baby early or anything like that. Um, but they definitely are, it's kind of priming your uterus to get ready to undergo labor contractions. And so let's actually talk about the labor process. So we've gotten to 40 weeks of pregnancy. We are uncomfortable. I can attest to that already. I'm at 31 weeks roughly at the time of recording this. Um, you're ready for, for baby to come, right? So let's talk about what labor is. So the scientific uh, term for labor is parturition, um, but we'll just call it labor. But essentially what's happening is there is a forcible expulsion of the fetus from the uterus. So that, that uterus is going to contract and it's going to push that baby out. Um, and interestingly, so the contractions actually begin at the top of the uterus. They, the baby should be rotated. So typically at 40 weeks, the baby has rotated so that its head is kind of laying against the opening of the cervix. And that's important because that also can help with starting the labor process. Um, scientifically, it's actually not known what starts labor. Um, it's just known that something in the female body starts the labor process. And that eventually causes the release of a hormone called oxytocin. But there's something that happens before this release that we have no idea what it is. Um, that's something that I'm learning about even just being pregnant. There's a lot of like voodoo and hand waving that happens because, again, it's not really very moral to study pregnant women in the lab. Um, but... What's going to happen is, is the top region of the uterus is going to contract and then those contractions kind of sweep downwards and essentially it squeezes the baby's bottom and pushes that baby's head against the cervix. Um, as labor approaches, as the, the expulsion of the fetus or active labor um, approaches, the contractions are going to increase in force and frequency. So they're going to get stronger, they're going to happen more often. And there are actually three stages of labor. The first stage is called the dilation stage. So the cervix is a very small opening. Um, again, we have our cervix here at the beginning of pregnancy, or sorry, the beginning of labor. And then there's a small cervical canal. Essentially, picture that you have a balloon that is blown up and it has a ping pong ball inside. The balloon kind of knot, so you haven't tied the balloon off, but this region is the cervix. And as you squish the top of the balloon, so if we squeeze up here, that's going to cause the bottom to expand, and that causes the cervix to dilate or to open. That's also going to cause the fetus to shift towards that cervical canal. Um, the Length of the dilation stage really depends on the mom. Um, it's it's very it's incredibly variable. On average, it ranges from eight or more hours. Um, however, the cervix needs to basically dilate to ten 
centimeters and it usually starts at less than one centimeter. So it has a lot of opening to do. Um, and then the actual during the expulsion stage, which is what we like really think of as labor or what we call um, your, if you are pregnant and you, your doctor would call this active labor, those actually last for about a minute and they occur um, between every 10 and 30 minutes. At this point too, the amnion should rupture. So this is what we call it when the water breaks um, during that stage. But let's imagine, okay, we've gone through this dilation stage, what's next? So that's the um, expulsion stage, the second stage of labor. Um, at this point, the cervix is completely dilated to about 10 centimeters. Those contractions are going to reach their maximum intensity. Um, it's kind of the worst pain you've ever experienced, according to what I've heard. Um, and you are going to have those contractions until the fetus has left the vagina. Um, and all of this is actually a positive feedback loop. Um, interestingly, the pressure that the baby's head puts on the cervix causes an increase in um, oxytocin to be released, which oxytocin increases the contraction force and frequency. Um, and so you're going to just keep having these maximum intensity contractions until eventually the fetus has left um, and is, has been born. This typically lasts less than two hours, so the, the active labor stage is not very long, hopefully. Um, before we look at the placental stage, though, I do want to talk about a couple of delivery issues that might happen. Um, so if the vaginal canal is too small, um, there is a procedure called an episiotomy, which basically the um, clinician is going to have to make, your, your practitioner is going to have to make an incision in the perineal musculature. Um, that's the musculature between kind of the vagina, the vagina and the anus. Um, doesn't sound much fun, but it allows that vaginal canal to be a little bit bigger to allow the baby to pass. Um, also, if the vaginal canal is too small, there's also many other reasons for why you might get a cesarean section. It could also just opt in for a C-section. But in this case, um, and that's what's being shown in this figure, women can get a C-section um, where an incision is actually made in the ab abdomen, so in the abdominal wall, and the uterus is open that way. And then, um, so rather than passing through the vagina, the um, baby will come out through the abdomen. And there's a couple of ways in which you can make these incisions. Um, I believe the most common nowadays is this low transverse incision. Um, these vertical incisions are not, I don't think, practiced much anymore. But once the baby is born, it's important to remember that there's actually one more stage of labor, and that's the placental stage. Remember that placenta has been growing and providing nutrients and removing waste for that fetus, and it also needs to be expelled from the uterus. And so um, they're also there after birth, there are going to be more contractions. Um, the uterus is going to start to shrink. Um, and that shrinkage actually is going to tear the connections between the uterus and the placenta. This usually takes about an hour, but during kind of those placental contractions, the um, placenta should be delivered and ejected from the body. Um, this stage might be a little bit bloody, um, however, your doctors will monitor this and it probably won't be dangerous, it's just, um, there's just some blood that comes with that process because it's just kind of, you have this basically circulatory structure that's just been ejected and, and kind of shed from the uterine lining. And at that point, you're done. You have successfully had your baby, you've ejected your placenta, and, um, you know, you can probably leave the hospital in a few days. So that is early development. So again, um, I haven't discussed kind of what happens in adolescence and older age. We're really just talking from fertilization through gestation. Um, but um, that is it for this lecture. And thanks for joining me. And I will hopefully see you guys around for the rest of the week before we end our semester together.